And good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you watch the show and where you're watching the show. Welcome to Healthcare Thought Leadership. I'm Arian Spears Carr, and I'm so glad you're here. It's a great Friday to be with you. It's 1230 Eastern Time where I'm located, and we are um, really uh, honored today to be talking around about this idea of co-creating and adapting to change in the healthcare industry. But we're going to go much deeper than not just talking about the ability to co-create, but we, we're really going to talk about what are the challenges facing change initiatives in, in our industry? What are the challenges facing organizations? Why it's important to visualize um, the creative process and the collaboration process. And, and we have an expert in our, uh, as our guest today, uh, Louise Harris, Dr. Louise Harris, founder of and change expertise of development leader at Change Design Institute. Louise, I am so glad you're on my show. You and I have had some great conversations mm -hmm. leading up to this. And uh, please introduce yourself a little bit better than I did. And there went something in the background. And at live TV, man, that's the way it goes. <laughs> and uh, introduce yourself, Louise. How are you? Hi, thank you, Marianne. Well, I hope that woke everybody up. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, sure I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've spent a good part of my career in the healthcare industry, um, first in, in systems design and then in e-health, uh, and now in transformation and really survival um, and moving from survival to thriving. And my 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 passion and and what I um, what really motivates me and, and is comes out of a lot of the challenges that I had earlier in my career where I just saw so much um, so much potential for change and so many ideas and just the inability to get things off the ground um, and it was so frustrating and that led me to uh, take some time out and do a PhD to figure out how can we solve this problem. Uh, and we did, actually. I did my research in healthcare, and we made some really amazing discoveries, I think, and solved some great problems. Um, so I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about this, Marion. Well, we're, we're glad to have you. And if you're watching live, please post in the comments, or if you watch the recording, where you're watching from. And if you have questions for Louise as we go through this process, please let me know. And I'm uh, just so glad to be here. Louise, one of the things that that um, that you and I talked about was the work that I do in the executive recruiting mm -hmm. space. I work with healthcare organizations all over the country, United States, Europe, and Newfoundland. Uh, but you work with companies all around the world, and we we use some of that work too. And the change in our industry is arguably, and I said this in the description, arguably, um, if you will at the highest level of it. I mean, so many things are coming down the pipe and, and a lot of the work is being done almost in these silos, nursing or focus on improving the nursing practice where the physicians are looking to improve the care delivery model that they're working under and et cetera. And that just rep continues to go from department, department, division, division, et cetera. And the question I have for you right now is tell me a little bit about why, this need to be co-creative, to be collaborative and engage uh, a lot of different people in this process. Why is that so important? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great question, Marion. And, you know, there's a couple of reasons it's so important, but I think the very first one, which I do think people recognize is the need to become patient centric rather than provider centric. And, and, you know, that is kind of a common rallying call. So the challenge is you cannot be patient centric in a silo because the patient's experience is not siloed from their point of view, their mm -hmm. experience is it's an integrated experience across the healthcare system. It's one experience. And so to, to actually be patient centric, you have to have integrated solutions across acute care, public health, you know, every aspect of health, as well as across physicians and nurses mm -hmm. and, um, you know, physical therapy and occupational therapy and psychology and, you know, everything else. Yeah, I, lo I love that um, point you made about how the patient doesn't experience it in just the situation with nursing or just the situation... Mm -hmm they experience holistically throughout their experience comes from all the collective 
components. And I think that is a key piece. One of the things I asked you offline and I really want to talk about uh, from your perspective is what has been the biggest barrier uh, so far to embrace this, this idea um, around you know, co-creation and collaboration and in a little bit, I want you to really dig down and tell mm -hmm. us a little bit what that looks like and why visualization mm -hmm. is, so, is so important. But it, tell me a little bit about what are the big barriers? What's caused, how did we get where we are? I guess that's maybe the question I need to ask. Well, I think, you know, there's there's a series of barriers. And you know, one of the barriers is natural due to silos is that every silo has its own perspective. And so when you are immersed in your own perspective, it is difficult to understand other people's perspective. And so your solutions and what you think very much come from your own perspective. So it's you have um, conflict that comes from misunderstanding and from the fact that everyone actually has a, a siloed point of view, right? So mm. one's looking at the, you know, it's the classic elephant issue, right? One's looking at the trunk, one's looking at the leg, one's looking at the tail and not realizing that their perspectives are that different. So that's one challenge. But then the next challenge, once you realize that is, okay, so how do you come to understand each other's perspectives? How do you create clarity? Because initially when you're bringing different perspectives together, it's like different rivers or streams coming together. There's a lot of turmoil and, and confusion, right? And that can be very um, stressful for people. Mm -hmm. And especially in healthcare, there's not a lot of room, uh, mental or emotional room to be handling any more stress. Exactly. Right. And so just purely out of self preservation to be able to do your operational work, people will pull back from that. So that's another um, big barrier. And then of course, you know, that leads us to the question of, okay, so how do we overcome that confusion? You can't prevent it. It, it is what happens. How do we overcome that? How do we get through that quicker? How do we enable people to see a bigger picture, not just their silo? And our traditional means of doing that, using a lot of verbal discussion and focus groups and flip charts and whatever, just add to the confusion because verbal communication is serial. And when we're trying to pull together different perspectives and understand, you know, what's the impact on the patient when a nurse does this and a physician does that and it's disconnected, you know, what's the impact on the patient and why does what the nurse do and the physician do need to be connected? We're, we're looking at like a multidimensional thing with all these different connections and you can't describe that in words. Yeah, and you, you, that, this was one of the main reasons. There's a lot of reasons that why I wanted to have you on the show, but this was one of the key standout um, points that, after talking with you, I really wanted to make. I wanted really wanted you to make. We do stick oftentimes in our industry to the narrative. It's mm -hmm. you know meeting after meeting after meeting discussion after discussion with some great action plans that come out of it, but mostly a to-do list that's not necessarily directed to solving the real problem. Um, and, and you talked about with me offline about the need to move from being just centered on the narrative and the discussion to creating a visual process um, to see that. And, and I shared with you, uh, offline about something I did as I was working on my coaching model, but mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit more about, about what does that look like? How do we bring everyone together? How do we start to move from creating a narrative to creating a visual uh, approach? That, that's mm -hmm. fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess there's two there's two parts to it. So, you know, in one sense, narrative is important, but narrative from the patient's perspective. So the story of the patient or the journey of the patient is really important. However, we can use visual narrative to describe that much more effectively than verbal narrative, because in a visual, I, I just... Um, imagine you say, you know, here's a path and here's some waypoints on the path. 
um, you know, like a Google map, when you say, I want to go to A and then B and then C, you get a map and it shows you the waypoints and it shows you the roads that connect those waypoints. And it shows you, you know, this is why you have to go around and can't go in a straight line because there's a big park here mm -hmm. or there's a lake here, right? You try to describe all of that. It'll take you forever to try and understand it because, you know, for those of us who are, who see, and interpret our world largely through how we see through our eyes. Um, if we only hear or only read, we're taking all these pieces and our brain is actually trying to construct an image. Mm -hmm. But we're each probably just constructing a different image in our brain because we're each constructing it and there's not enough words. Like if you were to write enough words, that would be like, you know, a thousand pages. And by the time you exactly. get to page 100, you've already forgotten what's on. By the time you get to page three, you've forgotten what's on page one. Exactly. Right. Our, Cause our memories are limited. So a visual actually, what it does is it takes your working memory and externalizes it. Cause we can only hold, you know, what, three to five to seven, depending on who you read things, mm -hmm. concepts, related concepts in our working memory so by creating a visual map you are extending your working memory and you are now sharing a common working memory with other people which we don't do when we're just talking because we all have our own working memory in our head mm -hmm. and so that's what enables people to see the different connections so much faster with way less cognitive load mm -hmm. um, and to agree and identify gaps so, so I, I would imagine when you first start working with an organization through this process, they have to, you know, to use the cliche, they have to crawl a little bit before they walk. Because I, I think if we've been in this model where we've we've just talked about things and and we may even within our own discipline use some kind of visualization, but as a collective, we've not done that. What's what's one thing that they where, where do they start? Like, how do they get started? Like, I, I guess my question is, and I'm kind of rambling, but like, what's one thing you can do that a leader could do with their team right now to start that process? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, you know, really, you need to get a little bit of training. Um, but it's, it's not, um, it's not ex it's not extensive training to get started. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let me just give you a little example. Maybe that would help. That would be good. Um, so I did my research in this, my PhD research, because what I was trying to find was what are intuitive visualizations? Because you can actually create a horrible spaghetti mess that nobody understands mm -hmm. with a visual, right? So just making it visual doesn't necessarily mean that everybody understands it, right? Well, that's true. So there are actually a whole bunch of, um, uh, note, uh, principles, it's called the physics of notations, but principles based on cognitive theory and, and how our brain processes visuals and all mm -hmm. of this that you can use. And that's what I studied in my PhD to come up with these diagrams that are super intuitive. And so here's a little example I'll give you. It was a rural hospital trying to solve a resourcing problem with resourcing the, um, hospitalists. Mm -hmm. So the, the doctors on the general wards and, and it was a group of rural hospitals and they each had a different method of doing it and none of the methods were working. And so they wanted to come together to standardize and figure out how to solve this problem. And so they had had focus groups and, you know, what, whatever. And they had had consultants come and write a two page summary because the physician said they wouldn't read any more than one page. So they had a double sided one page and now they needed to get agreement and it was physicians and hospital administrators who had been in this now they needed to get agreement that this is you know kind of the solution so that we can go forward and you know in canada healthcare is publicly funded so make a business case to government to get some money to solve this problem mm -hmm. and the consultants could not get a single person to give them any feedback wow not a single person and people wouldn't even meet with them, nothing. So it was stopped. And, and I have seen this so often in healthcare where you maybe can get some keeners together and mm -hmm. then you can't go forward because you can't get a review and feedback and, and approval to go forward. And when we, so what we did was we took that 
two pages mm -hmm. and we put it into two visual diagrams that one that showed what's the purpose from everybody's perspective mm -hmm. and then one that showed what's the scope what are all the things that are going to have to change actually because it's there were actually a lot of different things that had to change scheduling and utilization management and and the actual you know delivering the inpatient care service um and so then we we did an experiment and we said to all these people, busy, really, you know, busy physicians and administrators, okay, you don't have to read anything. We want to come and meet with you for 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to show you these diagrams and we just want your feedback. We want you to take what's wrong, what's missing, and what's okay. And that's it. And it's an experiment. So, you know, don't worry. Um, so they were willing, they were willing to give 10 to 15 minutes. Um, we had one hospital administrator. She had three phone calls in that 15 minutes of urgent things she had to answer. But because we had this visual, she could come back and within five seconds, she was back right where she was before she was on that phone call. Wow. It was actually quite in incredible. And, um, people, you know, it took us 30 seconds to explain the diagram because we had used all of these principles and we ended up, I would say, increasing the amount of information on those diagrams by about 100 wow. percent 70 to 100 percent people found gaps because they can't find the gaps when they're reading long verbal text they can't find the gaps and so those those who had read it didn't want to meet with the consultants earlier because they weren't convinced they had seen all the gaps and they did not want to give their approval to something that may have had holes in it and would come back to bite them later. So once in this situation, we discovered so many gaps, we also discovered that, hmm, you know what, we should have talked to the nurses and we should have talked to the allied health workers who actually <laughs> have to plan all the supports for a lot of the patients who are elderly to go home. Like, like there was actually a lot of things that were challenges that were part of the reason why it was difficult to re retain um, the hospitalists, not only just the financial compensation. And so we discovered all these other things that if they had not been addressed, if they just gone forward with their, you know, here's how we're going to restructure and refinance, they still wouldn't have solved the problem. But, and we were able to do it asynchronously. We did not have everybody in a group. We meet with mm -hmm. each person individually. Wow. So we didn't have to try and match schedules, which is another thing that's awkward, and then have people sit there listening to other people talk and say the same thing. And you know how people get frustrated with that. So that's kind of an example. Great example. Yeah. A great example. And I love the fact that they could always come back to the visualization and put them right back in, in the discussion appropriately, but also find those gaps. Um, and I love that story. And, and, and we have a lot of other stories. Let me uh, make, for those of you who are watching uh, for the first time, my show, this is called Healthcare Thought Leadership. It's a LinkedIn live show that's every Friday where I invite people to, uh, in the healthcare industry across a lot of different segments, life sciences and pharma and biotech and healthcare delivery as my guests to share their knowledge, to share their background and to share their ideas with, with my network and beyond. Today, we're talking with uh, Louise Harris, who is sharing with us her work around change. And um, we checking in, uh, appreciate Samana Jetty checking in from Alberta, Canada. Thank you, Samana, for joining us. And Karen Klein checked in um, and, and is a little bit of a long comment, but one of the, the gist of her comment is she comment is she was in healthcare for a very long time and is looking um, and considering coming back into the healthcare uh, arena, but it was, she found it somewhat negative and toxic um, and uh, is hoping to hear a positive message on, are there changes that are taking place? And one of the things that you and I talked about, Louise, is that this process of collaboration and co-creation is also geared at breaking down those toxic and negative situations. I'd love for you to speak to that and how this relates to burnout mm -hmm. um, when we go mm -hmm. through change initiative this, this way. Mm -hmm. Well, I could really relate with Karen because, you know, after my episode with eHealth, 
which was pretty much a disaster and so many hours with so little to show for it. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of quit healthcare as well for a while. As I, I had to, yeah, I did. Um, and, you know, kudos to all those clinicians and administrators who stick with it. Um, for sure, it's, it's not easy. Um, but I guess what I, you know, like to, to say within that, so I am seeing now compared to then a much greater um, recognition amongst leaders and amongst, um, you know, especially, yeah, leaders at various levels. So of course, you know, the people I did my research with, they're all directors and medical chiefs, um, et cetera. Um, so I'm certainly seeing there's a hunger for change. There's a realization that we can't keep doing things the way we are because nobody's going to survive. Nobody will survive. Um, so there's that recognition. And so now it is, you know, uh, how, how do we, what do we do about it? Which is exactly the question that you're asking me. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, my passion is to, as much as possible, get out there and say, there's stuff you can do about it. And it's not hard. Um, it takes a shift in perspective. It takes a willingness to learn something new. It takes a willingness to, you know, throw out the top down. Mm -hmm. And as leaders, you have to be, you know, more comf comfortable with risk. Um, but there are ways to minimize the risk, right? It's not bring everybody into a town hall and have mass chaos. Like that's what a lot of leaders are afraid of, which I think is why uh, leaders don't, are sometimes hesitant of this co-creation thing. Because it's like, it could come become chaotic. Like, how do I manage everybody having all these different ideas? And that's the other thing that visuals help with. Um, another one of my research projects was in a rehab hospital and they, you know, rehab should be an integrated team. You have a mm -hmm. lot of different disciplines working together in rehab. They were a set. They were not an integrated team. They were a set mm -hmm. and they wanted to work as an integrated team, but they didn't, they couldn't overcome their different perspectives and they didn't know how to share their perspectives without offending each other. Um, and they you know, hadn't been able to do that in the past. And so we used visuals for that too, where everybody did a visual diagram of their own perspective. And again, we made it patient centric. So we visualized the patient journey, a mm -hmm. really difficult patient. And so they were, that was actually really the first step because they were all able to agree on the patient story because they all experienced the difficult. So now they have, they have a positive experience. They've agreed on something. They've created a patient story together and they've actually done something together, which was, uh, you know, a big affirmation. So then we had each discipline put their own story on top of the patient story created and creating it in a visual and then mm -hmm. explain that story to everyone else. And, um, what we noticed was because everyone was looking at diagram mm -hmm. rather than looking at each other and picking up relations and seeing how things connected from the diagram so that they didn't have to concentrate so hard on the words mm -hmm. and people's defenses came down wow. and people actually heard each other for the first time and understood the perspective, and, and especially in this case, it was understanding the nurse's perspective because their working environment was completely different to the therapist's mm -hmm. working environment. Um, and they, they came to agreement on how they were going to communicate, which they had not had an agreement on for five years. So it, it completely changed the dynamics. And I think that was, um, so from that experience, they then went on to do, you know, more change themselves because they had learned how to communicate with each other without conflict, but wow. still being honest and authentic and getting their point across. I love that idea of looking at, at the whole process from the lens of where the patient story mm -hmm. is and being mm -hmm. that being the foundational story that everything else mm -hmm. builds on. I love yes. that. We've got a great conversation going on in the chat. Um, Mary and uh, Jenkins, uh, a gentleman who shares my name, uh, who's one of my friends and in, in a colleague, everyone is banging the table for change in healthcare. Yet healthcare is probably the most difficult sector to actually just to adopt a change. And that's what the work that you're doing is to try to change that particular paradigm. Mm -hmm. uh, Laverne Hamilton, thanks for checking in. This is um, uh, 
wow, this is fascinating. What do these types of visuals look like? And uh, uh, and if I want to discuss this approach in one of my papers, can you recommend a good article to reference? Louise, uh, share with Laverne where she can go to learn more about your work and maybe what these visuals look like. We should have, now that I think thought, think, thought about it, we should have created uh, uh, some visuals that we could have shared, something examples. Yeah. But, uh, and Laverne, thanks for checking in on that. Um, where where could where she can go where can she go yes well thanks laverne and and i you know i must say that i am um i am been a bit what's the word i want delinquent in getting all of this in a really publishable manner um i've been working a lot on putting together some courses on teaching people how to do this um but connect with me on linkedin um Definitely. And I will share some stuff with you. And I am planning on putting some stuff up on my website, changedesign.institute. So um, for sure, connect with me on LinkedIn or connect with me via email, um, louise.harris at stoss.ca. But you know, LinkedIn is fine. Marin's put that up there. And I will definitely respond to you. That would be great. And Samana has a question in relation to what we're talking about, this, this, this co-creation and co-collaboration work and the change initiatives, what can leaders in healthcare to do to support burned out employees mm -hmm. through your process? What are some things that you could share from that perspective? Samana, thanks for that question. Absolutely on point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's a really great question. And actually, um, I did uh, I did a whole day uh, workshop on that for the health executive healthcare leaders um, here in Canada. Um, where we actually wrestled with that as as a group, you know, what can you know not not own because everybody is burned out actually, you no, know, from the top all the way down, everybody is experiencing burnout um to to some level, and so I I think there were you know two two kind of key things that came up about that, and one was realizing we can't keep doing things the way we are, so that is the very first thing is recognize that we can't keep doing things the way we are we have to change the second is is that um everybody is cognitively depleted right now and so a lot of burnout that is being experienced there's definitely you know in healthcare there's a fair amount of emotional burnout but there's also a lot of cognitive burnout that has come from not only having to deal with the pandemic, but deal with your own life. So we, all of us, um, we've had to make decisions daily that we've never had to make before. Like we spend most of our day on autopilot. Our brain only has so much energy mm -hmm. and our brain is fantastic at being able to create all these neural paths so we don't have to consciously think about stuff. We can just do stuff on autopilot. But in those last few years, we haven't been able to do stuff on autopilot. We've had to think, do we wear a mask? Do we not wear a mask? Do we go? Do we not go? Do we let the kids? Do we not let the kids? Do we visit elderly parents? Do we not? Like all these decisions we've had to be making, it's been like running a marathon every single day. And, and you know, we know what that does to your muscles. Well, it's been doing that to our brain. So I think that's the second thing is, you know, for leaders to realize that uh, people are cognitively depleted, and therefore, we have to communicate in much more efficient ways. We've got to stop bombarding people with a lot of verbal information that they just can't absorb anymore. We have to learn to communicate much more clearly. We have to learn to really, I think we need to learn to communicate visually so that because it takes way less cognitive load to um have vision, you know, to read something visual. Yeah, I, I think the idea of being intentional about the cognitive load that we place on our followers as leaders mm -hmm. is what a great point. I love that point. And Samana, thank you for that question. We only have a few more minutes. I have your link um, to your website in the in the banner. And by the way, we'll share all these links in the comments for those of you who are watching live or watching the replay, but you, cre you created a, a readiness assessment assessment mm -hmm. frame. The you call it frame the future readiness assessment, um, that the, the, what the, the, um, the viewers can, can take. It's a free assessment. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that and how that, how it works. Yeah. So it's just a really short assessment. It's five questions. Um, and really, you know, it's a checklist 
as well. So um, basically, it's going to give you five areas to rate yourself or your organization or you as a leader. Where, you, where are you um, on this, in this particular area? And each of those five areas are critical for you to be ready to actually engage people. So when I was saying before about often leaders are hesitant to get too many people involved because they're afraid of chaos and how do I manage all these opinions and whatever and... Um, there's actually processes and some tools that you need to have in place and some structures that you need to have in place, like how you're going to make decisions and how you're going to communicate and how clear is your vision and certain things like this um, that are really important. And how do you bring clarity and uncertainty? Because we actually don't know what healthcare needs to look like. Like we don't know, we, we cannot create a, a detailed vision of the future state. We really don't know, we have to discover. And so how do you create clarity in the midst of uncertainty? And you can. So this assessment, in a sense, you can look at it as here are the five areas that you need, you know, you need to do and have in place before mm -hmm. you start bringing people in so that it, when you do, it's actually a good experience for them. Otherwise, if people just get overwhelmed, um and it's chaotic then that's just even more discouraging uh, absolutely and uh and to tie a bow on it nicole denham who's also in your in this same world uh she totally agrees with the concept of change overload mm -hmm. and how we need these smaller bursts of info um and again going back to that earlier point that you made thank you for that comment nicole uh that being aware of the cognitive load that we place place on our team and 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 all these different things. Louise, we are completely out of time. Uh, I knew this conversation was going to do exactly what we've done. I knew we were going to go. We need to have you back on the show and maybe go go a little bit deeper. But thank you for being on Healthcare Thought Leadership. Uh, any last comments you'd like to make to the audience? And then I'll wrap us up. Uh, my last comment is, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Absolutely. I like that motto. And and for those of you who are watching, this is Healthcare Thought Leadership. It's my LinkedIn live show every Friday where I get to bring these amazing people like Louise on the show to talk about healthcare, life sciences. What are the things that are making a difference in the world? If you're not familiar with me, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I do a lot in that space. Please like and share this with your your uh, with your network. This show will stay evergreen on the platform so you can re watch other parts of it if you missed it. And if you'd like to learn more about my work at Comar Partners, I'm an executive search leader. Uh, please go to ComarPartners.com. Have a great Friday, and we will see you soon. Thank you so much, Marion. Really welcome. enjoyed the conversation. Absolutely.